Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to worship. I'm so glad you're able to join us this morning and I can tell you right now that I'm in one of my favorite spots in the entire world. And yes, it's kind of weird because it is an empty field behind me. Maybe a lot of you recognize it. Or maybe a lot of you would recognize it a little bit better if I kind of went like that, right? Now some of you may wonder why this is one of my favorite spots in the world. Well, to be honest with you, during our first time that we were out from church, when we started having our worship service out here, I fell in love with this place. It seems weird, right? I mean, it's the side of the church. But to me, it seems like we were able to find and discover God in an entirely new and amazing way out here. The numbers are still looking pretty bad. Um, they may be getting a little bit better. Um, and so we're starting to see a little bit kind of draw down on the number of cases. Unfortunately, the hospitals are still pretty full. And so it's still not time for us to come back inside, but the weather sure does seem to be nice. So starting next Sunday, as long as the weather cooperates with us, we're going to be back out here again. And I would invite you to come and you can either stay in your cars, but I would also invite you to bring some of your favorite chairs and uh, set up outside. Um, the science tells us that as long as we're outside, then that breeze is going to help knock down the virus particles and, um, and we should be fine. So I invite you to come and join us uh, here for worship starting next Sunday, and we'll be out here. If you're unable to join us, not a problem at all. We'll be live streaming like we have in the past. We are actually going to go inside in just a little bit for the rest of our worship service, but I did want to say good morning to you, and I hope that today is a beautiful and wonderful day for you. Um, I hope also that it's a time of celebration. And so as we come together to worship, as we come together to pray together, as we come together to celebrate the King of Kings, I pray that today is for you a great day because it is a day that the Lord has made and we're going to be glad in it. We're going to be cheerful, we're going to be happy, and we're going to love on each other and most certainly we're going to love our Lord. Can you join me in a little bit of prayer as we get ready for that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you Lord for providing this time, for setting apart this time for us to be able to celebrate you. Lord God, whatever might be burdening us or keeping us from being able to see you and hear you clearly. We just pray, Father, you would remove it from us right now. And that this would be a time, Lord, that we could celebrate you with all we are. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I'll meet you inside. Let's sing.
pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Today, we pray for those that are in need, for Betty Rogers, Candy Rogers, Cassie Niles, Cheryl Brett, Clay Godley, Craig Med Jr., Daniel Ritchie, Dean Carter, Dolores Merchant, Faye Bowen, Heather Torres, J.D. Wheeler, Jan Waters, Jessica Bland, Jesse Jones, Joyce King, Karen French, Kinsley O'Berry, Kyle and Patricia Medina, Lacey Strale, Lori Smith, Lynn Bigby, Marie Elena, Marilyn Crowley, Mark Manning, Melanie Collins, Roberta Ryan, Robin Smiley Shubtrain, Rufus Clark, Vilvin, William Gilbert. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those that are bereaved, the families of Carol Rondeau, Christina Bachelor, Penny Mahoney, Rodney Riley, and Carolyn Landrum. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our shut-ins, for Jackie Eaton, Margaret Beasley, Margie Crowley, and Coleman Sharp. We pray for those who serve in the military and their families, for the family, for the people of Haiti, for the people of Afghanistan, for health workers, for police officers, for firefighters, for paramedics, for teachers, for those imprisoned, for those in spiritual distress, for our leaders and for our pastor. We pray for those that are suffering from forest fires, for those affected by Hurricane Ida, for those affected by floods in Tennessee, and for those unnamed or unknown. We lift all these prayers up in the awesome name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When it comes right down to it, you have to decide for yourself. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and today I'm doing my last episode in this series that I've been doing about why we can trust the Bible. And this isn't the last time I'm going to talk about why we can trust the Bible, because I think it comes up a lot, but this is the last episode in this specific series. And throughout this series, I've been giving you reasons why you can trust the Bible, and I've also been talking about reasons why people say we can't trust the Bible, but then me kind of explaining why those reasons don't really make sense. And an important point that I wanted to make at the end of this series, the thing I'm going to be talking about today, is the fact that you are responsible for what you choose to believe. Not your friends, not your parents, not me, nobody but you. God has given every one of us the choice to either believe him, believe in him, and and do what he wants us to do, or to try to do things our own way. He gave us that choice. You get to decide what you believe is true. And so in the previous episodes of this series, I think I've given some pretty good reasons why you can trust the Bible. And I think I've also shown how some of the reasons why people say you can't trust the Bible, those reasons don't really make sense. But in the end, you still get to choose what you believe. Now, I do want to point out that me saying you have the choice of what you want to believe, that doesn't mean that whatever you believe is true, right? There are right and wrong answers. You might hear people talking about your truth or like relative truth or say things like truth is relative. It's not. Either something is true or it's not true. 
and our choosing to believe something doesn't make it true. And what you believe is always your responsibility. You know, especially as kids, it's easy for us to just say, well, I'm going to believe whatever my parents believe. But when you and I stand before God, he's not going to ask what our parents believed. He's going to ask what we believe. And Jesus said that if you believe in him, then you will have eternal life. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus to save you from your sins, then he will. Your name will be written in God's book of life. And the Bible says that unless your name is written in the book of life, you can't go to heaven. And some people try to say that not believing in God is not a choice that they made. They're just waiting for enough evidence to believe in God. But that's not how it works. Whether you believe in God or don't believe in God or something weird kind of in between, that's what you have chosen to believe. And for me, I, I want to show you the way to life that I see in Scripture. Right? I want to lead you to Jesus. That's like the number one thing I want to do. But in the end, it's still your choice. And it's not my responsibility to make you believe. And there's no such thing as so much proof that, that you don't have a choice but to believe. Not yet, anyways. There were people who saw Jesus performing miracles. They saw it with their own eyes, and they still did not believe. They chose to not believe. And so I think it's important to point out that if you are a Christian, if you do believe in Jesus Christ, you do believe that God is real and that the Bible is the inspired word of God, it's not your responsibility to make other people believe that. It's important for us to share our faith. It's important for us to share the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But in the end, we're not responsible for what other people choose to believe. In the Bible, it talks about giving a defense for your faith, right? It talks about explaining why you believe what you believe. And when people try to say that, you know, believing in God is dumb, you can say, well, it's not dumb. Here's why I believe what I believe. And so my challenge to you guys today is I want you to sit down and really think about what you believe. What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus? What you believe about Jesus is literally the most important thing ever. And I've given what I think are pretty compelling reasons to trust the Bible, to, to trust Jesus. And I sincerely hope that you will believe in Jesus Christ. I so very badly want you to believe in Jesus. He is the only life bringer. But in the end, what you choose to believe is totally up to you. Said I'd never see it true. They don't know what keeps me going. I guess they never have made you. You know my life was in shambles until the day you came along. Lord, you gave me a brand new song I'm still holding on Lord, I'll never let you go You gave me a smile You touched my heart and you touched my soul Lord, I burned them to the ground I'm still holding on You're the best thing I ever found Oh, the likely not to prosper Was left hanging on my head You never count for nothing That's what most people said I've been known to
to be unsettled I never stayed alone too long Lord, you the treasure I've been searching for And Lord, I'm still holding on sanctuary. service has been awesome. Um, let, let's start looking at uh, our scripture today. We're, we talked about James uh, in the first chapter last week. This week we're going to go to the second chapter of James, um, beginning with the first verse. Um, now, um, I want to tell you something that's kind of exciting to me, and, and I know this is going to sound crazy to some. A lot of people believe in numerology, um, the belief that numbers have power. I don't know that I can go that far, but I did find it interesting that our uh, subject matter today is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And I know for most of you that probably doesn't mean anything, but for me, my favorite number is 217, and so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I am going to read it for a piece of paper. I forgot to bring my glasses up with me up to church. And you know what? Actually, let me rethink that for a second. There is just something incredible about having God's word in your hand. So let's see if we can do this. You may be witnessing a miracle right here if I'm able to read this through here. But let's uh, let's see what we can do. There's just something about holding God's word in your hand. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad that we have cell phones and that we can pull the Bible up anytime we want to. And, and Lord knows I do that. Um, but I don't know, just something... Something about holding the, the word in your hand. Pretty awesome. All right, again, James chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. 
My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, you're, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Let me just say that one more time. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers? If a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Let's pray. Father God, first of all, Lord, thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to be able to read that scripture from your holy word. I just pray, Father God, that, that we come together today and, and we find a way, Lord, to hear what you're trying to tell us. First of all, with me, Lord. I, I know the words are coming out of my mouth, but I pray every week, Lord, that you would change those words, the words your people need to hear, but also change them to be the ones I need to hear as well, Lord. And I would ask that in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Y'all, it was funny and an interesting thing that happened this week. Um, it's amazing how many things that happened in my life happened. I don't remember how we got in the discussion about it. Um, I think it was something to do with the fact that somebody, one of my children, I think, were pointing out the fact that once again, I was doing something that wasn't in keeping with, with what I had preached on Sunday morning or on a Sunday morning. Usually that conversation starts off something like, Dad, didn't you preach about that once? And I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of love it because it helps remind me of the fact that, um, just like we talked about last week, right, we're being watched. We need to make sure that we're, we're keeping the faith and not just on Sunday mornings. And so that's an awesome thing. But here's what's funny about it. Mary had made a comment to them and said something along the lines, this is exactly what she said, I'm sure, but something along the lines of, um, don't you realize that almost all of Daddy's sermons are actually directed at him? And it's funny, but it's so true, right? Um, it really is. A lot of my sermons, I realize that God is speaking to me. And I pray he's speaking to you as well. And I think he is. Because I believe a lot of the issues that we share in life, we share. They, they affect all of us. And so I truly believe um, in my ministry that God has kind of created a path for me so that um, you know, I like to call it my Forrest Gump life. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, Forrest has all these different jobs. And that's kind of how it's been in my life, too. A whole bunch of different jobs, doing a whole bunch of different things. And experiencing different things, not only for myself, but also seeing how those experiences affected other people. And I think that he used that preparation for me to be in the place that I'm at today. It's probably very similar to what he's done for you in your life, if you actually choose to look back at it. But the thing about it is, is that all of us that come here, we tend to share a life story together. Um, oftentimes, our paths, while they may be wildly different in where we grew up and what we did growing up, a lot of our experiences actually are very much the same. 
how we live, what we do, who we care about, the you know, life that we do. And, and the fact is, is that God kind of uses that, I think, to draw us together. Now, the problem with that, the problem with a lot of things that we receive as gifts from God, is that we begin to see them and use them in ways that are different than what God expected us to do. The fact is, is that much of what God does still remains to me a mystery. Um, I'm sure it does to you. Have you ever sat back and wondered, Lord, why is it like this? I mean, it could be some big things. Last night I got home and um, I'd gone out, I don't even remember where I went now, but I'd gone out to run an errand or something like that. And I got home and the, the, the uh, stars had come out and well, the stars are always there, but it got dark enough for me to see the stars. And I was actually just stopped. And I don't know what made me look up, right? But I don't often do this anymore. But I stopped and I just looked up at the sky. And I thought, look at all of those stars. And I thought, Lord, why do you have to make everything such a mystery? Why is it that we can see all of these stars that we know are suns? And we know there are planets there. And we wonder whether or not there are others on those planets as well that God has placed there for a reason. And we wonder, or I wonder at least, what does that all mean? Why? Why did he even create all of this, right? I mean, I know he thinks it's good, but there's plenty of times been upset about it as well. Why is it that he did this? Well, we know he did it because God is a creator by nature, right? That's his nature is to create things. Um, he created us. He created the stars. He created the earth. And all of it is wonderful and sometimes scary, but wonderful. But why the mystery? What about our relationships with other people? What about in our own circumstances and situation? There have been times in my life that I've asked the question, Lord, why me? And I base that upon something maybe bad that has happened, right? Lord, why am I going through this time? Why am I going through this difficulty? But the fact is, is that much, many, many more times than that, to be honest with you, I've stopped and I've asked, Lord, why me? Why are things going so well for me? Why is it that, that I have been such incredibly blessed in, in stuff, in things, in family? Y'all, I have a fantastic family. God allowed me to find my soulmate at a young age. God gave me wonderful children. God has given me friends that have stood beside me. He has given me mentors that have led me through some dark times. He has blessed me beyond measure. And the fact is, I've been willing to bet you that most, if not all of you that are watching right now, can say the same thing. And if you stop and think about it, the question has to come. Lord, why me? Why is it we have that which we have? And yet there are others in the world that have nothing, whose families have been ripped away from them. We've seen that so much, right? Even in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, we have known people that have been struck and harmed so much by this. Um, others who, who, have, who have suffered great loss that maybe even had nothing to do with the pandemic. But you sit there and you wonder, I ran into a friend of mine um, today when I was going out to, I'm sorry, yesterday, I guess it was yesterday. Yesterday when I was going out to the supermarket and um, I, I walked in and I was, it's so funny, y'all. I went to the wrong one. I, it wasn't the one that I was planning on going to, but God is amazing. He does these things. And I walked into him and this man had just lost his son. And I, I don't know what you say in a moment like this. But we talked for a, for a moment or two and, and we shared some and then we went our separate ways. And I'm left thinking, what would I do if that happened to my son or to my daughter? Yesterday, we got a phone call from a parent or actually from a, a student who actually was a parent from a student. I didn't, but Mary did. Got a phone call or email, I guess it was an email, from a student letting us know that his mom had just passed. 
from COVID. Y'all, his mom just died. This is a high school student whose mom just died. How do you deal with that? And how do we reconcile the place that we're in right now? Right? I mean, my father died um, several years ago, but I got to spend a lot of time with him. And my mom is alive and, 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 and doing okay. And it's funny, uh, earlier this week, she made the comment to me that, you know, she was, she was ready whenever the Lord was ready to take her. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you are because I'm not ready for you to go. And I'm not. I do know one day that day is going to come. It's not something I like to dwell on, but I know one day it's going to come. But I have such great memories and, and such great interactions with her as a child and as a young adult and as an older adult. And I value that. And, and so many of us are like that, right? Many of us, many of you that may be hearing this, have parents that have already gone home and are with the Lord now. And others maybe are, are, are a little bit older. But the fact is, is that we have been blessed by their guidance and by their love. Our friends. Right now, as I sit in this church and I, I, I look out at empty pews, right? I mean, you're seeing this view, but if you were to look at this view, you realize that behind me are, are empty pews. And, and it's hard sometimes to be able to sit here and, 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 and talk to you that I know are looking at me from at home when all I see is emptiness. And the fact is that many, many folks deal with that every day of their life. They, they, they're dealing with emptiness. They're dealing with the fact that, that that nobody seems to hear them or to see them or to interact with them. It's funny, when I saw these cues when I came in, you know one of the things I thought about? I thought about something that John Wesley said. I call John Wesley our accidental creator of Methodism. He didn't really want to create another denomination, but he did want to create a group of people that would commit themselves and dedicate themselves completely and totally to God. The problem is, and the issue is, is that his biggest fear wasn't that we would be a denomination or not. It wasn't whether or not you know, we would follow certain rules or, or not. I mean, he was a rule follower, and he believed in, in rules, at least the ones he thought were important. Now, his biggest fear would be that the people called Methodists would become a dead sect, would become a dead people. That these empty pews would not be examples of the fact that there's no people here, but examples of a church with no heart. And I'm going to tell you, that honestly is one of my biggest fears. Is that we are a people who just go about doing and, and saying in ways that make us righteous, that makes us feel like that we're important. And the fact is, is that's one of the problems with the fact that we are all the same. Is it's easy for us to put ourselves as us against them, us against the rest of the world, us who fill these views, and us that don't. So what does that say to us? Well, the scripture we read today talks about the fact of how important it is that we live a faith not just of words, not just of, of even belief. We didn't read that far, but later on in the scripture, right, it says even the demons believe in God and they tremble. But they're still demons. You see, God is not calling us just to have faith. God is calling us to take our faith and move it into action, into what we do and how we live. But, but even in that, even when we think that we're doing that, and I know so many of you have done that, and I don't want you to think in a moment that I don't realize that. I am by no means saying that we have not taken our faith and moved into action. What I want to say to you, though, is that we are in a great danger, grave danger, of it only being for a time, for a time. I, I was convicted of that. Um, I guess, I don't know, three or four days ago. So I'm driving down the road, 
going up to the light up there on 17, right? And, and as most of us know, there's almost always somebody on the edge, on the corner there, that's saying they're homeless, what it gets to be. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of go with a feeling, right? If I'm driving up and that light turns red and I feel God calling on me to do something, I'm going to do it. And here's what's funny about that, because it usually means, right, I go up and I try to carry around these, excuse me, please, these McDonald's gift cards. I've talked about this before. I was out of McDonald's gift cards. So I'm pulling up and I'm out of McDonald's gift cards. And I'm like, well, I just give a couple bucks. So I pull my wallet out and I realize the smallest bill, I only had two bills, by the way, in my wallet, but the smallest bill in my wallet was a $10 bill. And I thought to myself, God forgive me, I thought to myself, what am I going to do now? I don't have anything small enough to give this man. And, and it's almost like I can hear God just, and maybe I was, I don't know, hearing God say, are you serious? Are you kidding me here? There's a reason why you have a $10 bill in your wallet. And there's a reason why I'm telling you that you need to do something right now. Stop fighting me on this. Stop, stop arguing with me about this. And so I took the $10 bill out and I handed it to him. Y'all, I don't have any idea what he's going to do with that, that $10 bill. Not at all. But what it did do was just prove to me that I have moved myself out of being relevant in what it means to serve God. You see, if we truly believe that all that we've been given was God's first, is giving us to be good stewards of it, why do I hesitate? I mean, if the smallest bill that was in my wall was a $100 bill, why would I hesitate? You see, again, it comes down to the fact that God wasn't asking, what do you have to give? What God was saying was give. And it's so funny because how many times in my life had somebody that I consider a peer come to me and said, can I borrow this or that? Things that are much more expensive or even I'm in a bind right now. Is there any way you can help me out? And I can tell you right now, those amounts were not a dollar or two dollars. But how about in my own life, right? In my own life, I can remember Mary and I being young and, and um, being very low paid in the military and Mary going to school and us trying to raise a little baby and everything else that we were trying to do. And I can remember our car breaking down and us having no money whatsoever to repair it. And I'll never forget this man, Steve Oreck. He was a NCO that was in our unit, in my unit. And, and him saying, I have an extra vehicle. Why don't you just borrow it until you have time and the ability to fix yours? And that's what we did. I, I don't know what his faith is. I don't know where his connection to God is. But he had something that he had been given by God. And he offered it up for our use. And because of that... We were blessed. You see, that's what our faith is supposed to be driving us to do, right? To find ways that we can use that which we have been given to go out and to do in order to be able to serve others. <clears throat> and I think that's what James' conversation here with us is, is that it's not just about loving God, but it's about loving people. It's about allowing your faith in God and your love of God to shine through in the things you do. And the best way you can show that is when you are sitting there and sharing that faith and loving others in ways that are completely outside of what your norm would be. Outside of the people that you think of as being at the right level. And y'all, it's not always about things. Oftentimes, it's about spirit. You see, the fact is, we live in a world that has a lot of people in it that probably have a level of comfortableness with God, a level of connection with God, with, with their Savior, that's much different than what our connection is. And, and there's a way and a time in our minds that we actually think of ourselves as being better for that. And, and let me tell you something. The fact is, we actually are better for that. 
not better in a sense that we're elevated, but a sense that we're going to be elevated. Amen? It's not just a sense about that, you know, I deserve more than you. It's about a sense of because of who I count on, because of who I love, and because of who I've accepted, I know what the rest of the story is going to be. But if we turn our back on those that have lesser spirit, that are weak in the spirit, that, that don't even know who Jesus is, and boy, isn't that easy to do? Then what are we doing? I mean, wasn't our greatest commandment, the, the commandment that was, the, the, not the greatest commandment, excuse me, but wasn't our commandment given to us as Jesus left to go, go and in going, make disciples? So we're to love God, love others, and go and make disciples. That sounds exactly what James is saying here. He's saying, turn your faith into deeds. Because here's what happens. Your deeds, the way you treat others, the way that you don't show favoritism, the way that you treat everybody as if they were a child of God, guess what that means? That means, y'all, that your faith turned into deeds generates an ability for others to receive faith from God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You actually have the power to be able to help others see what God is trying to give. And that's incredible. That, that's an awesome thing. I can, I can tell you right now that whenever I hear somebody say that they have come to the Lord, that is an incredible experience. And I, and I just pray, Lord, if I had something to do with that, thank you. But at the same time, those who have turned away from God, and I, I know in my heart that there are people out there right now that because of words that I've said or deeds I've done or words unspoken or deeds undone, have not accepted Christ. And I'll, I'll have to face up to that one day. I'll have to face judgment for that. But what's worse yet is the judgment they may have to face because of that. There's a popular song out there that I, I, when it first came out, I kind of thought was kind of weird. Talking about the fact that, you know, we all bleed the same color. And it's true. We all bleed the same color. And here's what's interesting about that. Today, we're going to celebrate communion together. And you see what the color of that juice is? It's red. And it's red because it's to remind us. It's not Jesus' blood. But it's to remind us what Jesus gave for us. You know what? He gave everything for us. So why should we hesitate when well, we're asked to give a little bit, we're asked to do something a little bit outside the norm. That worries me. Not from what you might do or not do, but what I might do or not do. It worries me that, that these pews, that these pews may one day be filled again and yet still empty because the spirit stays bottled, net, bottled up inside of this beautiful sanctuary. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for all the things that we have done or not done, said or not said, the times that we have trespassed against you by trespassing against each other, <clears throat> by not loving, by not serving. But here's the thing, Lord. We know, Father, this could be a new day, a new birth, that, that this Sunday is yet another Easter morning in which, Lord, you can take everything that we have done and remove it. And so, Lord, I pray for myself and for my brothers and my sisters for forgiveness. And I know, Lord, that all it's going to take is for you to say the word. And I'm forgiven. And so, Father God, 
I accept that forgiveness of which you offer it. And I pray, Lord, that each person that hears my voice also accepts the forgiveness in which they have been offered. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. So we're going to take communion or a love feast, however you want to consider it or think of it. This is very odd. I'm going to tell you right now. There is a lot of folks out there, a lot of my brothers and sisters, that believe we shouldn't be doing this. That taking communion like this in an online environment just is not the way it's supposed to be done. And the fact is, it's not. This is not the way it's supposed to be done. It should be done together in community. And I would invite you that even right now, if you didn't pick up a cup or uh, one of the wafers, if you have some juice or some lemonade or some bread or your favorite meal, whatever, um, maybe right now you're, you're, you're drinking your coffee and, and maybe you got a donut or something. That sounds good. I might get those after the service. Maybe you have one of those things. Oh, that's good. Okay. Because here's what I want us to concentrate on this morning. I don't want us to necessarily concentrate on the fact that we're taking communion. I want us to concentrate on the fact that today, just like on Sundays that we do take communion, and for that matter, Sundays we don't, we remember who God is and what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, we need to remember that Jesus is real, that Jesus preached and delivered the good news, that he healed people, that he walked the earth, and that he lived as we live. He experienced what we experience in order to take the weight of sin off of us. That when he joined and gathered together those people in that room, when he celebrated this, what we today call Holy Communion, the breaking of the bread, he did it, remember, to remind. You know, he took the bread. And I, I don't know what this bread looked like. And it doesn't matter. If you have a donut right now, it works. I just want you to remember what he did, right? He said, after giving thanks to his Father in heaven, take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and that's a remembrance, y'all, not of past, but of past, present, future. Do you remember us talking about that? This is a realization that God is outside of creation looking in and his son is with us in our past, in our current, and in our future. And so, Father God, I would pray, Lord God, that you would bless this bread and you would make it be for us the body of Christ. And that as we partake in it, and that no matter where we're at and what we may be partaking of right now, even if it's nothing at all, that we remember something more important than how this tastes or, or what this texture is like, but instead we concentrate fully right now on who you are and what that means in our life as you renew us in the Holy Spirit. So take, eat. And the story continues. Jesus takes the cup. And once again, he, he lifts the cup up and he says, Father, bless this. And he looks to his disciples and says, I want you to take and drink of this. I want you to remember that this represents the blood I'm going to spill for you. Here's what's funny. We often kind of make fun of this and the fact that the, not make fun, but the fact that the disciples had really no idea of what was to come. You see, as far along back as it was for us, we at least are able to understand in some sense what Jesus went through. They had no idea at the time. And so I don't know what was going through their minds, probably confusion when he said that it represented his blood that would be shed for them. But for us, it represents so much more. It's not just about his sacrifice, but more so about our salvation. 
And so as we take and we drink of this, and no matter what it is from you, again, I don't want you to think about the coolness or the hotness. I don't want you to think about it being coffee or juice or water. I want you to think about what it means that Christ did this for you, that Christ did this for me. And so take, drink, and in drinking, Remember that which Christ has done for you. Father God, Lord, we thank you that for what you have given for us and for how you have loved us and for what you have done for us. We pray, Lord, oh God, that we would begin to stop being a people just about what we have, just about church on Sundays, but instead find ways in which where we are at right now, we can serve others who are very different from us. That we can serve everybody in a way, Lord, that's pleasing to you. And Father, I would pray, Lord, that during those times that we are given the opportunity in which to be able to serve outside of what we think of as being normal that you would give us the strength and power to do that in an amazing, incredible way. I would ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray, pray together on our knees. Let us pray, pray together on our knees when i'm down on my knees with my face to the rising sun oh lord have mercy on me let us drink wine together on my knees let us drink wine together on our knees when i'm down on my knees with my face to the rising sun oh lord have mercy on me let us praise god together on our knees let us praise god together on our knees when we're down on our knees with our face to the rising sun oh lord have mercy on we let us break bread together on our knees let us drink wine together on our knees when we're down on our knees with our face to the rising sun oh lord have mercy on me it's not stopping So, our service is concluding. I pray that this has been a time of uplift for you. I pray this has been a time that you feel yourself moving closer to Christ. Um, it was always been shared with me that all kind of living Christ's life is kind of like being on a, a weird little hamster wheel, right? You go around in a circle, and sometimes you feel like you're getting nowhere, but you realize that the more times you go around that circle, the more you learn about the circle, the more you learn about Christ. And that as you do that, you get better at that. And getting better at that doesn't mean getting stronger physically necessarily. It doesn't mean being able to run faster, thank God. But what it does mean is as we get to know who Christ is and experience him more, 
we get to grow within that, which then completely destroys the idea of a hamster wheel because we get to leave the wheel and we move on to another wheel. Again, we may sometimes feel like we're spinning our wheels, but God is taking all this and building character within us to go out and serve God's people. I hope you remember that I love you. Remember more that God loves you and in all things, to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you.